Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about health and specifically protecting your health and also at the same time thinking about protecting the health of your family and, and people around you. And really, when we think about that, I'd refer you to a couple of NEB guides in there about uh, protective equipment in general and then one that goes into quite a lot of detail about uh, how to select the appropriate uh, gloves and the, uh, how to select the right materials and so forth. We often think about this risk or hazard uh, potential formula. This is the risk or the hazard that it presents to you because of the pesticides that you might be using. When we think about the toxicity of the product and the exposure that you're receiving. There's a few things we can do to help reduce the toxicity and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that, uh, of the product that you choose to use. But mainly we focus on exposure simply because it is uh, the place that you can work the most on reducing uh, your uh, potential risk. And that's all about PPE, uh, not just following the label because it says you have to follow it, but following the label because it's a good guideline that's telling you what you need for a good reason is to protect you from potential explo uh, exposure. Now, there's an AC in the book that also talks about managing the risk of poison, signs and symptoms and poisoning. It goes through the different classes of insecticides and uh, so forth and talks about what those signs and symptoms are. It's a good idea for you to kind of be a little bit familiar with that so that you can tell the difference between what might be uh, caused by a pesticide that you're using or, or just a flu symptom or something like that. Um, it's also good to understand a little bit about how pesticides might get into your body. And obviously the number one thing is going to be dermal type of exposure and that includes your eyes. We were talking about eye protection earlier. That's the number one way that pesticides find their way into our bodies. And so if you think about the way I'm dressed now with long pants and long sleeve shirt, there's not a lot of skin exposure that, that's there really. And, and the, the primary way that you're going to potentially get exposed is really your hands. So that's why we emphasize so much about wearing gloves. And by just putting those gloves on, you've reduced your exposure to just what's exposed around your neck and your face and, and your head. So uh, often we don't have exposure in those, that part of our body. It's, it's lower because of the type of applications we, we do. So uh, keep that in mind. Oral exposure is, is mainly about failing to wash your hands before you eat uh, or smoke. And if you do that, you've pretty much eliminated that as a potential exposure. Inhalation is usually about the formulation of the product. If it's a dust or a granular, uh, you're going to have more of that uh, potentially getting into the air. And if you wear a respirator, you've just eliminated that chance. Now something else to kind of keep in mind is really we often talk a lot about acute exposure. That's a, a single dose of uh, exposure that you might get to a pesticide and have an immediate reaction showing those signs or symptoms that you can find in the, in the proceedings. Uh, but another one that we're concerned about is the chronic exposure, those small repeated exposures that you get over uh, years and decades in, in this business. And I'm gonna go into some detail about some of the health effects that we know about uh, that are starting to emerge that, that I think you should be aware of along those lines. Now I said there were some guidelines about reducing toxicity. And one of the ways you can do that is just by choosing a product that's less toxic. And a guide for that is the signal word. It's not going to give you an exact LD50 number or something that will tell you definitively what the toxicity is, but it will guide you a little bit. If you choose a caution, uh, for instance, you're going to be a lot better off than if you're choosing a product that's a danger label. You've just reduced that potential risk or hazard uh, uh, quite a bit just by choosing that lower level of toxicity. Okay, I uh, want to talk about the Ag Health Study. Now I'm certain that when you were here the last time to recertify, you heard about this. Some of the information you will recognize from what I have talked about in the past, but there's a lot of new information that's coming out as well. This Ag Health Study uh, focused on applicators in Iowa and, and North Carolina, and it covers a whole range of different agricultural practices and crops. Uh, but the Iowa people in particular are going to be really similar to what uh, types of things that we do here in Nebraska. It included about 90,000 participants. That's a huge group of people. Uh, they were enrolled between 93 and 97. 
And basically what makes this study a little bit different is typically what you might read in the newspaper or hear on the news is studies where they know, uh, they suspect a certain disease, for instance, might be caused by environmental factors. So they, they look at a body of medical evidence, they look it through carefully, they might even contact the people or their families and ask them questions about what they might think have, would have caused this uh, illness. But it's never very close to cause and effect. This one gets a lot closer because through the course of the study from that early participation, uh, they surveyed and they know a lot about these people's background. They've been tracking this 90,000 people over time. And if you think about a group of people that large, you're gonna see over the course of 10 and 15 years, you're gonna see health effects happen. It's just natural. Any city of 90,000 people, you're gonna have people get ill uh, every year from, from something. So if you keep track of that and you use statistics to make comparisons with uh, the general population, you can start to draw some conclusions. Now, some of that, and overall, when they first looked at uh, most cancers, they found that uh, the participants had a, a lower cancer rate, which was a really good thing. And they think it's probably due to uh, rural living, uh, maybe less stress, less smoking, uh, being outdoors and, and things of that nature probably helped uh, with that overall. But when looking overall, what they did notice is that the spouses had about a 50% higher rate of skin melanomas and the applicators had a 14% higher rate of uh, prostate cancer. And you can see here the prostate cancer was associated with several different things, including methyl bromide fumigant, chlorinated pesticides. Now those are all gone now, but they're still influencing some of our health outcomes. So people my age uh, in their 50s and over, we were around when we were using those kinds of products and so we could potentially uh, be impacted by them. But then there's some other ones here uh, with men that had a family history of prostate. They also had uh, associations with, uh, with that disease. Now they looked at, at uh, the spouses of the applicators and there, here's one that kind of got my attention. If you think about, okay, it's just me, I'm out there spraying, I don't have to worry about uh, my family. Here's an, an example where that may not be true because the spouses, even though they were not actually making the pesticide applications, they had an increased uh, uh, occurrence of breast cancer. And they found that it was associated with these things that are listed here. Now obviously, this is an old chemical. We don't use it anymore. Dialdrin the same. Captan is it's either on its way out or, or, or will soon be, but uh, diazinon maybe is, is around a little bit. But it does tell us that what we do does influence our spouses, it does influence our, our family. Now this one, retinal degeneration, uh, an example of that would be uh, macular degeneration that you hear about. The most consistent evidence here was associated with fungicides. And in particular, you look at the application methods that were in play, Those are the, these are kind of real high exposure kind of application methods and also there were certain crops that were more associated with, with that. But definitely fungicides, vision loss, uh, a pretty strong association. Then there were others. There were several organochlorines, several organophosphates, and a couple of carbamates. So this one was really across the board. Several different classes of chemicals were associated with uh, retinal degeneration. They looked at glyphosate and uh, the first look at it, they look at those diseases that they know have been associated with uh, pesticides in the past and those that they're most concerned about, including prostate and lung cancer, and they saw no increased risk. Now one that they did uh, see that showed a slight uh, increase uh, was the multiple myeloma. Uh, they're not saying that it's an association yet, but they will continue to study it, and I'll, I'll report back to you if anything emerges out of that. Part of the overall ag health study, they actually sampled residues in homes. They would go into the homes of the participants and uh, sample the dust and, and uh, surfaces within the home. And they actually found glyphosate, atrazine, and, and 2,4-D residues in those houses. So that's telling us somehow those chemicals are getting in, into the houses either through volatilizing and being in the air and finding their way in, or we're tracking them in on our shoes or something like that, that they're finding their way into our homes. Now these two are not associations, but, but they are indicating they may increase the risk of these two 
uh, uh, health effects. And, and again, we'll continue to watch that and see if anything develops, and I'll, I'll report back to you if they come out with anything new on that. Now, Parkinson's, you know, you hear a lot of that in the, in the news these days, and, and they suspect that it might be associated with pesticides. There's a chemical, MPTP, that is known to cause Parkinson's disease. Well, the, that chemical has a real similar uh, structure to Paraquat, and that's the reason why they're studying it. That's why they're interested in looking at it. So far, there hasn't been a strong association with any of the chemicals in this particular study, but uh, that kind of explains why they, they look at that. Now, there are some thyroid effects, and these are the spouses, again, of the applicators. Uh, about 12.5% of the spouses had some type of thyroid disorder. And they found that the association uh, was between, just in general, insecticides and fungicides for the hypo or the underactive thyroid condition and fungicides alone for the hyper or the overactive type of thyroid condition. So again, there's an effect that is with people we're coming in contact with. Cutaneous melanoma, uh, there's an increased risk with these chemicals that are listed, Maneb, Macozeb, Parathion, Carbaryl, and so forth. Uh, ADHD, uh, this one again is one that's been in the news more and more lately. There's a couple of different ways that they looked at it. One was that when the pregnant mothers were exposed to malathion, the, their children that were born later had an increased risk of ADHD. The other way of looking at it was that uh, if they measured uh, the blood level, no, it was urine levels, uh, the urine levels of children, if they had an elevated amount of organophosphates, they also had a much higher risk of ADHD. So there's definitely something going on with uh, certain pesticides and uh, ADHD. More information about the study is there. Uh, you can also just do a general Google search and you can find this Ag Health study. There's a couple of really good websites that uh, give fact sheets and if you want to read the medical literature, you can do that. Uh, all those are, are listed there. Uh, we'll continue to watch it. I'll, I'll keep reporting back to you. I want to go through a couple other uh, studies just to give you food for thought here. This one, uh, EPA and HUD, just across the U.S., sampled a number of different uh, homes. Uh, they did surface wipes in U.S. kitchens, and look what they found. This is 89% of the homes they found permethrin, for instance. My take-home message from this was that, you know, some of these chemicals like chloridane and, and chlorpyrifos or Dersban or Lorsban, we haven't been using, obviously, chloridane for quite a long time, yet there it is still in the house. So some of these chemicals, once they get inside, they don't break down very quickly and they persist for quite a long time. The other message I got from looking at this was as we've started using the uh, pyrethroid chemicals like permethrin, cypermethrin, and then the newer fipronil product, they're turning up inside of our houses. So we've got to be a little bit more careful of what we're doing to, to help keep them out uh, of our homes. This one just establishes once and for all that if you have direct contact with pesticides, those pesticides do go in, into your body. They can be found in both blood and urine. And the highest amounts in this study of pesticide were found in applicators that basically didn't follow label instructions. They found specifically that if they did not wear their gloves while mixing, or if they spilled the pesticide during the mixing operation, or if they had direct skin contact, or if they repaired this equipment without wearing their gloves, or if they smoked during mixing and spraying operations, those people had elevated amounts of pesticides in their bodies. So there's a definite link between exposure and the chemical going into your body. And just the reason for me throwing out all this information to you isn't meant to scare you or make you stop using pesticides, but I do want you to think more seriously about following those label instructions, not because it's a legal requirement, but because you want to protect yourself, you want to protect your family. That's the reason for doing it. Follow those uh, PPE recommendations. Don't come home and you're too tired to, to wash up thoroughly that night. Don't forget, washing up is really important. Get those residues off yourself. Leaving your shoes at the door might be a good measure to help keep those residues from transferring into your house. And then finally, laundering is really important I know you've heard this before, but when you wash your clothing that might be contaminated with pesticides, it can transfer, and, it's, and studies have shown it will transfer 
from the contaminated clothing to uncontaminated, and the residues will still be there after the wash cycle is complete. So do those wash separately, and it, they even recommend washing out your uh, washing machine with a, a clean cycle to remove those residues. Following some of those things just can help in the long run keep you a lot safer and, and healthier. So that's it.